Hi, I'm John Silvey, and this is Art and Design. Today, my guest is Elliot Earls. Elliot, thanks for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. I'm thanks really glad you're here. Thanks. Now, you started and you grew up in Cincinnati, I did, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what was it that drew you to the arts? Uh, I grew up in a, in a small, middle-class, Irish Catholic uh, neighborhood. I went to parochial schools and a and a Catholic high school. And so that's a very conservative kind of background that's not, in some ways, not dissimilar from uh, Birmingham or Bloomfield Hills. And um, there was uh, an artist who lived in a, a house uh, on a cross street, a couple houses away from us. And uh, I remember the first moment that I saw this woman's work that the that the life seemed so different from things that I that I had been um, you know I was probably seven years old or eight years old and uh, that was not something that I've, I I saw in my environment I saw doctors insurance salesmen professionals everyone was very professional but it was not uh, art was not something that you saw and uh, the moment that I came across or the moment that you know I came across this woman's studio I was just kind of blown away by the whole thing and so uh that art classes my very first class in uh in high school was was my first art class it was the very first thing I remember walking into the studio smelling linseed oil and and um the rest is history as they say <laughs> so from Cincinnati where'd you go to school I went to the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. I, I, um, the school that I went to was is an excellent academically uh, demanding school, but I was not a motivated student in any way, shape, or form. I was more interested in athletics, and so I, you know, I, it was the it was the '80s, and I was interested in soccer, and uh, so I wanted to go. Well, I actually did not want to go to the University of Cincinnati, but the University of Cincinnati at that point had uh, had a highly ranked uh, art and design school, and we, my dad took me to meet with the um, meet with one of the uh, admissions officers, and they said with my SAT scores that just wasn't going to happen. But they said that there was a uh, a school that was very similar uh, called the Rochester Institute of Technology, and actually the the interesting part was that they had the, at that point they had the uh, three-time Division II national championship soccer team. And so the light bulb, I mean, that was super interesting to me to marry those the two things that I was most passionate about. And so I, I went there with the, uh, with the intent of playing soccer and also, um, and also studying art and design. But uh, I, I did not make the varsity team as a freshman. I made the reserve or whatever whatever the, the term for it was. And, and at that point, I realized that, that playing uh, college sports was a fool's errand. I was not going to. At that point, there was almost no um, professional soccer in, in America that you could make any money off of. And so I just. Uh, but you played. Uh, no, I, I quit before the after I didn't make the, the varsity, okay. the varsity team. I, I just I said, no, I'm going to just study my. So, yeah, that's. So from RIT, you ended up in New York too, right? Yeah, I I, uh, I went to uh, every year between every year at the end of the year, starting my sophomore year, I uh, I would take my portfolio to New York City and couch surf on anybody uh, on friends of mine, uh, actually family friends couches. There was a friend of mine or a family friend who graduated from the same high school that I went to five years before me that was uh, working on Wall Street and he had a loft and with a bunch of dudes on Horatio Street and I didn't really even know him but my my parents are good friends with his and so every year I would take my portfolio to to New York and I would call people on the telephone uh, I would look in the uh, the design annuals and call and literally literally just say could you you know check out my portfolio and get some feedback and um, so that that led to over my spring break of my senior year, I I, uh, I uh, got a job at a place uh, with Rudy DeHerrick, which is like one of the most historically important uh, American modernist graphic designers. And so I'm, I'm, I moved to, to New York and uh, started working as a designer. How long were you in New York? Uh, in the New York area, I was there for 15 years. But in actual New York City, I was there for 11 months because... 
uh, when I went to work for um, DeHerrick and Poulin Associates at that point, I, I thought that I knew what I was doing, but, but I really, I, somehow I managed to get the job, but I didn't manage to hold the job. I was fired 11 months into the thing. And I remember that uh, Richard Poulin, the, the, uh, the partner, said that uh, we can't help you any longer. And you know, I was 23 years old, but basically at that point, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know, I knew design principles and I knew how to design, but I did not have any idea that, that if you were working, as an example, if you were working with uh, a sign manufacturer, that we were doing signage for the World Financial Center, which was right next to the World Trade Center at that point, and I was on that project. And I didn't realize, I didn't know that you were supposed to call them on the telephone and that you were supposed to check in on the progress of, of, of very simple things. You right. Know? right. So, so I remember that one of the partners came to me and said, so uh, the, the signage project was going to be, is, is due to be installed at World Financial Center, you know, tomorrow or Wednesday or whatever. Uh, is everything ready to go? And I was like, yeah, I, I guess. <laughs> but so they, they, they released me I, I, and, and I was with my, uh, uh, my wife, uh, Darlene, who was a metalsmith at Tiffany and Company, and um, so I felt so humiliated at that point, which is ridiculous. Yeah, but what a great experience! No, it was great. Yeah, no, it was, Just, it was great. What I mean, because you go through all that and it sticks with you, yeah. and then it rebounds you to the next place. Yeah, and I had a good friend. I had a good friend in Connecticut uh, who um, I went to undergraduate school with, and the second that I got fired, he's like, "You want to come work uh, at the firm that I'm working? I'll talk to the talk, talk to the." Uh, design director. And that's where I really learned, learned how to manage projects and learned about typography. And so, so my wife and I, Darlene and I, we basically stayed in the New York city area for about a 15 year period, just rather than moving to Brooklyn, we moved to Connecticut because, uh, well, it's kind of a long story, but we moved to Connecticut. It was like a 30 minute train ride. No. And it's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. Wow. And then, okay. So you've got this career, you're doing it for 15 years. Yeah. How's, how do you connect to Cranbrook? Uh, I think that I th there's a there's a concept in um, in Stoicism which is that the obstacle is the is the path you know which is you know kind of cliche that's going around the internet uh, currently but it's it's actually it really reflects my experience and what I mean by that is that um, so I you know my first work experience I felt didn't go as well as I had, I had uh, hoped I uh, as I mentioned I got released because I wasn't performing uh, well enough. Then I went to work for uh, this firm where I, I, lear I learned a tremendous amount. And, and my wife said to me, um, Darlene had ar already, she's 18 months older than me. She said, uh, if you're gonna get your grad, if you're gonna go to grad school, you should go now. So anyway, I applied to, to Cranbrook as a grad student in the early 90s. I was accepted there and after I left, I went, uh, after after I graduated from Cranbrook, I, I worked for Atlantic Record, or Electra Records, which is part of the Atlantic Group at 75 Rockefeller Plaza, designing. And what what year was that? This was 1993. 1993. Through, okay. Yeah. And again, that was a, that was a, <laughs> that was a, that was a job that lasted about six months again. What albums did you work on? Uh, the thing that got me released from my job again. <laughs> Yes, was, a professional. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, the international group had a had a had a um, they Don Henley I guess was the the main business dude for the Eagles and they had a they had a Eagles Greatest Hits package and um, I I was not a fan of the Eagles and I and I so when I was asked to design the package for the international group whatever I couldn't do it with a straight face. I did like a country, I did kind of like a, like a hokey country and Western thing. And they, they got tired, they got tired of the fact that like, I wasn't, I was not, um, but I also did a gospel group called DJ Rogers. And, and, and I did some stuff. Uh, I did, I did the like hard hip hop sampler and a bunch of, a bunch of different like sampler. They used to do samplers, but, I, but again, I was, re I was released from that position. And then going back to this idea of the obstacle is the way and how, how I ended up here. It's that, that so over and over these moments of, of, of failure actually were, were catalysts to do something that were, that was much more bold and much more ambitious. And, and so, um, after I got released from Electra records, I got, I got a computer and started doing for 
uh, none such, which is their new music label. I started doing the guy is like, Hey, I heard, you know, like at 75 rock, the guy down the hall, it's like, Hey, I heard you got fired. He's like, he's like, can you do some design work for me? So I got, I got a computer and basically <laughs> was doing the design work for them. But in the mornings I was working on spoken word, poetry, electronic music, and uh, kind of performance stuff. But I, I couldn't get my career. I couldn't get I really couldn't get anything to, to happen. And so I was at a, I was at a cl uh, client meeting in Manhattan and the guy said to me, you know, in the basement or not the basement, but on the first floor of this building, there's this theater called here. Uh, and it's like a black box uh, performance space. And he said, uh, he said like a lot of the stuff that you're doing looks like it, it would be, it would be better in a performance environment. So I basically, he said, you should just call the director. And I did that like almost out of a sense of desperation, not desperation, but like that things weren't actually happening well and, and, and something that I wanted to do. So I, I, I sat down in a meeting with, uh, with this woman and, and uh, she said, well, you want to do a, a run of like six performances, one a month for six months? And I said, yeah. And so literally I did, I, I, I had some of this material, but basically what I did was I, I did video projection and electronics and electronic uh, music. And I sent out um, emails and uh, postcards to this list uh, through Emigre magazine that, that I had. And somebody somebody from Italy was at the Museum of Modern Art, showed up to my first show, and and, and literally like like six months later, I was like performing in Europe and doing <laughs> it. So over and over, whenever whenever things went kind of haywire, I kind of doubled down on the um, ambition and kind of. Uh, fearlessness of the things that I was doing. That ultimately led to me um, becoming uh, one of the artists in residence at Cranbrook. Uh, before we get to Cranbrook, yeah. I noticed, I saw some of your old videos yeah, yeah, from yeah, the 90s, yeah. and you were shooting all that stuff, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were documenting, yeah. even back then you were documenting. Yeah, I bought a, uh, I bought a Canon mini DV, like a, the big white Canon mini DV yeah. camcorder. And, and I think it was because of the fact that as a classically trained graphic designer, I realized that as a visual artist, you have a product, but in performance, you know, if I did a, I was fortunate to get an emerging artist group, uh, emerging artist grant from the Wooster group, which is a really prestigious. Yeah. yeah. And they were everywhere in the nineties. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Willem Dafoe, I think is a founding member of the, the group. And so, you know, I went backstage as an example had, and uh, had no, I prior to this whole, I had really no idea what I was getting into. And I looked at, you know, looked in the green room, and there's photos of Spalding Gray and Willem Dafoe and Laurie Anderson and like all these people that had performed in this space. And I was like, anyway, um, uh, your question was. Oh, no, I was just saying I realized that you were documenting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but yeah. the thing is, is that so I could perform at a place like that. Or, and, and as an example, uh, as a result of that, I ended up I ended up at the Exit Festival in Crete in Paris, you know, performing at this festival to like 2000 people. Um, but I realized that there was that in the moment you have you, you don't if you don't document it you have you absolutely have, you have nothing. So, so from the jump I I, I started to try to um, produce uh, you know DVDs and video footage of it. Yeah. Um, Cranbrook. Yeah. You applied uh, for the artist in residence, or they they went after you. How did uh, this it's more that I the the the, the former artist in residence was was familiar with my work and there was a kind of tragedy where there was a uh, uh, Scott Makla and Lori Haycock Makla were uh, a, a married couple that w ran the department for a five-year period and then he he had an allergic anaphylactic shock reaction where he, he he just died instantly I mean like almost instantly like overnight and um, to make a long story short she she was familiar with my work and she she decided that she wanted to move on and so she said, uh, I think you'd be great for this position. Now, I, you know, there's an entire process and you'd be one of many candidates. But uh, if if you're interested in, in, in this position, you should probably apply. And so I, I applied and then went through, a, you know, like I was there for a week doing a performance piece, lecturing and meeting with people. And what year was it? That would have been 2000. The, the interview process was like in 2000. I started in 2001. Right about that time, wasn't... No, oh, Keith Haring painted that mural on the wall. Uh huh. That's right exactly. About that time, yeah, right? Right, a year before that. They I just think, uncovered 19, it in 1999. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> man, so many great things. Yeah, it, I I saw some of that footage from yeah. that time period, yeah. and this is before um, 
before the Macintosh yeah. and before Final Cut yeah. and all this. And it was great to see the rawness yeah, of yeah. it and, oh, yeah. and that you were documenting. And again, it's still important today and we have all the, yeah. the tools at our disposal and you're doing it currently as yeah. part of your practice, right? Yeah, YouTube, yeah. When did that start? That started in 2015, and again, it start it started as a reaction to to you know. And I'm going to keep it real. It started as as a sorry. I know I'm not supposed hey, to cause. Hey, it's a family show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, that started as a reaction to to the natural life cycles that artists and designers go through. And you know, design design is a process where people come to you as a client and they give you they give you projects, and it's commercial. But if you're if you're a kind a specific type of designer or artist, a lot of your work is uh, is self-initiated it's it and um you know as you you can only be the hot new thing for for a brief period and i talk i talk to i've spoken to many artists and designers that i know that do similar type of work that are older than me and some now that are younger than me and so the, the point being that um uh you know in my in my mid 40s uh there's a period where you look you look at your your career you look at your work and you begin to wonder you begin to wonder like what what is the nature of this anyway to make a long story short starting the youtube channel is it was is really was really um about responsibility it was about the idea that that uh that you, that i can i can talk about the things that i want to talk about and i can frame both my work as well as the kind of cultural condition uh through my own lens um so not being a kind of not being a victim but but actually having kind of agency and youtube provides that so so in 2015 i started the channel and it grew it grew very slowly because of the i think because of the nature of the stuff that i'm talking about but recently it's it's started to uh pardon me well i gotta put in a yeah. shameless plug right yeah, now yeah. How can people find you on YouTube? Uh, you can go to YouTube and type in studio practice or type in my name, Elliot Earls with two L's and two T's. Yeah, now there's a couple hundred episodes on there. And you covered the gamut. Yep. Um, and I um, I know that you made reference to this before. Yep. I think your kids were saying you're nothing like that in person. Yeah. As you are. It's a persona. Well, my my grad student, one, my, I have a, I have a, senior teaching fellow Lindsay Camillo who is not my assistant but I, I work with her and and uh, she helps me out a lot and, and um, I think that she's the first person that pointed out that the 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 because I came out of a performance I have a performance performative history and I'm interested in kind of avant-garde stuff the first versions I think the, that anytime you turn a camera on it's not actually it's not actually you you know but I think that the the earlier version the further you go back into the channel the more of a kind of persona that that uh, specific persona that there is that's being adopted um, I've I've really made an attempt to try to um, to kind of downplay that a little bit like to to make the pieces more conversational and I, I i still think that anytime you switch a camera on for any human being it's not an accurate reflection of who the person is but but i but lindsay is the first person that kind of pointed that out and i don't necessarily see it as a negative thing i mean it was intentional it was intentional but you know that that the 133 episodes are really an attempt to explore the form and so so I think it goes they go they go from being very uh, extremely stylized with a lot of electronic music and animation to much more conversational. Um, and I, I'm not I'm not sure how it'll develop from here. Do you think that you're the same person on YouTube as you are in class? Yes and no. Uh, some of the more recent videos, I think I think yes. Uh, there's a specific type of thinking that I get involved in and the kind of communication that I get involved in that like when the YouTube videos are actually working, you, that kind of thing you could see in critique. I think that there's there's a kind of uh, sense of humor that uh, that is very childish that I have that I don't think is really is really apparent in the in So you're the, immature. Yeah, I'm extremely immature. <laughs> you know, but well, I don't think that comes it, out. In, it's funny because you, you come off as a philosopher more yeah. than anything else for me on there. But yeah. then I, I see these other episodes where you're giving this practical advice yeah. that you don't normally get in art school. Yeah. And you're doing deep dives on, hey, you should have an investment plan. And, oh, yeah. Um, 
there's some really good information in there. Well, I keep it. I what you know, with my I think I, you know, you'd have to ask my grad students, but I, I, I you know, I really attempt to keep it real. And uh, you, back, you know, when we were talking about my development, a lot of self help books are very, very cliche. But in a in a in an adolescent, um, when I was attempting to. Um, develop as a human. I, I, I read nearly every self-help book that I could possibly uh, read. And, and the point being that I'm really interested in that kind of ethos, the notion of self-development. There's this, there's this Latin expression, magis, which is the full development of, of one's potential. And there's, a, there's an Indian, uh, well, he's dead now, but uh, a, a guy named Sri Chimnoy who talked about the idea that the, that the human comes up, that the mind, the body, and the spirit are linked. And um, that's, that's a very obvious statement, but that the full development of potential involves those three things. And I think that that's something about the kind of Jesuit training that like the, the, a lot of the message that I, that I kind of got from both my parents and as well as the kind of the good messages that I got from my educational environment was this notion of this relentless pursuit of the full development of your potential. And so like self-help books and no, no BS kind of, uh, advice, um, not, not from me per se, but you know, in a mentoring situation is a really important component, I think of, of what I'm interested in. So with people that are close to me, uh, we share a lot of, uh, like there's a really great book called Atomic Habits as an example. I don't know if you know that book, but it, it, it really, it's not, it's not so much self-help. It's, it, I mean, it is self-help, but it's really about, it's really about like that, that in order to, to have any habit actually stick, it has to be frictionless. There has to be this, this guy like breaks these kind of things down. So in a lot of, in a lot of ways in the grad program, uh, we're talking about theoretical and philosophical ideas, but we're also talking, I'm, I also bring ideas like what you would see in Atomic Habits into the, into the discourse because of this desire for the full development of potential. Well, everybody needs that, especially art students, because it's not in the curriculum. No, and it hasn't not, been forever. No, so no, and, I have a lot of thoughts about it. <laughs> What what did you say? Jesuits don't wear madras pants. I think that's what I got from what you just said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know. You get too philosophical. Yeah, exactly. It gets me nervous. Exactly. So, so oh, I have to put a plug in because you have a show at Wasserman right now. I do. Yeah. And you provided this opportunity not only for your own work, but yeah. you brought your boys into it. I did, yeah. How did that all come about? Well, I have three children. My daughter Scarlett, uh, to give her airplay, she's protecting her brand, quote unquote. So she's not participating in the in the show. She's an actress. She was. You can look in, uh, in the twenty twenty film uh, "Marry Me" with Jennifer Lopez and uh, Owen Wilson. She's in the film, uh, and she is studying drama at, uh, at uh, NYU's Tisch currently. And I have a son that's 20, uh, Henry, who uh, is studying art and design at the Cooper Union. And then my son, Harris, is, uh, is a traditional kind of oil painter, among other things, but is, a, is currently 15 years old at, uh, or 16 years, 15 years old at Cranbrook Kingswood. But anyway, the point is, is that my wife is a, uh, is a metalsmith uh, and writer. And um, having my kids having grown up at Cranbrook, they were in the studios all the time and I'm, I'm, I'm constantly making and my wife is constantly making. So they, they saw that, you know, as an artist, you, you can, I mean, it's very difficult. It's very difficult, but as an artist or designer, you can, in fact, contrary to popular opinion, you can, in fact, make money. You can have a kind of stable family. You can, uh, you can do really interesting projects. And they also, they also saw both my graduate students, my partner, Darlene, and I making work very fluidly. So sometimes, like the, a long story short, when I watch all three of them make, I don't know whether or not it is uh, genetics <clears throat> or if it is, <clears throat> pardon me, or if it is um, their environment or both. But they, all three of them make so fluidly. Like I, I like to think that I'm an extremely fluid maker. Like I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm making, drawing, writing, whatever, all the time. And the critical voice of judgment is not something that that plagues me in a way. Um, but I watch and I think, you know, there's a real fluidity with which the, the three of them make. And so, so the Wasserman Project show was this idea that uh, the 
the three, the four people that I, I would want to collaborate with most and most deeply are my my partner Darlene, Scarlett, Henry, and and Harris. And so, the two the the two visual artists, um, Darlene is as well, but she has her own thing going on. So uh, it was it was, yeah, it's a pretty cool show. It's still up until June. Well, <clears throat> again, I I feel I'm watching yeah. your series on YouTube that I have kind of an understanding of the family and an understanding sure. of you, and You've created this environment for these kids that's amazing. Do you go up north? Where yeah, are you, yeah. Leland? Yeah, we're like on, we're in, on Lake Leland, Lake Leland, in Leland. Yeah. So spending the time up there yeah. and then yeah. fostering all this creativity. Yeah. These kids have had a great experience, and you've done a great job. Well, thanks. I have to put a plug in because I I feel I yeah, have yeah. an understanding because of what you share. Well, I I hope so. I mean, you know, life is. I I do have <clears throat> I do have. Uh, I know how the sausage is made in, in art and design, and I know how it is made in education. And uh, so to suggest that I don't have reservations about my daughter studying drama or my two boys studying, uh, studying art and design, I, I do have a lot of uh, reservations about it. You know, but I think I just made a video on on artificial intelligence and art school meltdown. And how, and anyway, the, the point being that um, <laughs> that's our next episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean the the point being that that AI is an example. You know, if you're if you're uh, a radiologist, uh, you're as much at risk mm -hmm. as a as a visual artist. You know, so I think all parents have concerns about what their what their children are doing. But yeah, well, you've given a great foundation. To Thanks. all three of those kids. Thank you very much. And they seem like really good kids. Um, I hope so. Well, they're, they're, it, it, it shows. Thanks. Yeah. And, um, and the experiences that, that they've been able to obtain through your experience, just that you share and you have an open communication, puts you at the top. Well, thank you so, very much. Yeah. Um, I know about bad parenting. <laughs> I got it down to a science <laughs> yeah. at this point. So. Right, exactly. Um, Elliot, uh, I, one last thing is... Um, what is the program that you're in charge of over at Cranbrook, and yeah. how can people find you? Sure, it's the 2D uh, department. So the Cranbrook Academy of Art is a, is, a, is a graduate program exclusively. So we don't have an undergraduate program. So people have BFAs before they're admitted. And uh, there are currently 11 departments. I run the 2D, which is two-dimensional design department. But you can think of it functionally as a graphic design department. Now, when you think of graphic design, those things that come to mind are like posters, books, uh, logos, identity systems. We do do those things, and I do do those things, but we live in a kind of uh, post-disciplinary age where uh, there's a lot of really experimental work going on, everything from performance work, electronic music, painting, sculpture, photography. You would find that across the board at many of the, but you can just look up Cranbrook Academy of Art 2D department. And then, um, I mean, you're in there with Emmy too. Is she yeah, Emmy's in the, in the Emmy's in the print media department yeah, across, she, the, across the street. Yeah. She just came in, came in uh, in the oh, last two years, right? right? On. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. To uh, 2019. Yeah, it's all a blur. Yeah, the last yeah. couple of years. Yeah, yeah, I know. But, but, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna out you, but you can easily see where your door is. Oh, I know. One of these things is not like the other. I did not campus. do that. One of my grad students did yeah. that. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a kind of an, it's an annoyance <laughs> because actually I see people walking a dog and I'll go and I'll go to the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have a, my cup of tea and, 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 and I'll walk in and I can see that, that sometimes they're like, they, they can, they can make the, you know, they're, they know that Cranbrook can be kind of freaky at times in a good way. But I think it's might not be a good thing. I didn't put that on the door. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I think I was on campus when we asked for this yeah, interview, yeah. and I, yeah, yeah. I had to go check something out on the sculpture park. I yeah. came back and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, there yeah, he yeah. is. Well, next time you got to just you just knock on the knock on the window. Oh, yeah, I I did. I, 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 I have did. a bad habit. Yeah, yeah. should have. Yeah, yeah, if you I was there. there, were you there? No, I don't think you. No, were if there. I was there, no. I definitely yeah. would. Yeah, because I was pounding. Elliot. No, no, I would have. I would have answered. <laughs> I definitely would have answered. Ellie, I gotta say, I really appreciate you coming Thank on the show. Yeah. I really appreciate what you do with your YouTube channel, Thanks. and I gotta put a plug in yet again for it. Thanks. It's uh, Studio Practice, yeah, right? On YouTube, yeah. With Elliot Earls. That's right. And I highly recommend that people check in. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming it's on. Real pleasure meeting you. <laughs> yeah, yeah.